Good morning. In this video, we are going to learn how to write a book. And I'm going to take you from start to manuscript or transcript so that we can, and that's a little clue there, so that we can get to the point where we're moving forward and we can get to the point where we can finally launch our book. Now, different people write at different speeds. Different people have different timelines. I know some people who have books already written, but they're waiting for uh, either publishers or other things to set in motion. Other people have spent years writing books and have yet to even get close to the finish line. I'm here to make your job a little bit easier based on my experience writing three books now and just starting the process of writing a new one. So more on that in a second. But for now, welcome in. If you're live, thank you. We're starting a little bit early today because I have a workshop that I'll be leading, uh, a paid workshop, in fact, an SPI workshop on video podcasting, which I'm really excited about. I was up probably until two in the morning last night uh, rehearsing and going through a number of things before today's workshop. Today's also battery day for Tesla, so I'm super excited about that, being a Tesla owner and investor. And um, yeah, so schedules have been mixed up this week for whatever reason. But tomorrow, we're in fact gonna start even earlier, 7.30 a.m., 8.30, or 7.30 a.m. Pacific, 10.30 a.m., Eastern, and then we're going to get back to normal on Thursday, 9 a.m. So tomorrow will be a little bit earlier, half hour earlier than right now. Anyway, thank you so much, everybody. Say hello to your friends here. If you're watching the replay, hashtag Team Replay, and uh, let's get started. we got a lot to cover. This is the Income Stream to help you achieve your dream. All while we keep it clean, this is the Income Stream. It's the kind of show where you can come and go, but then you leave inspired with no fee required. The Income Stream with Pat Flynn. Welcome again, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We got all these green names in the house and several others as well. Uh, Green Names are members here, but whether you're a member or not, I appreciate you for being here. Uh, Gail, Kathy, Sue, Peasant Uprising, House of Films TV, GTO. Awesome. Let's see. Louis Louis B., Beth, Just Samson, Martin, uh, Remodel Media. Fantastic. This is great. Thank you again. Makeup by... Oh, I lost the name. Makeup by Antonica. We got... Okay, cool. We got uh, Ryan. Excellent. So we're going to continue our conversation today about books. Yesterday, we talked all about why and what can happen when you write a book. I ended on a high note talking about monetization and sharing that I've, with one of my books, Will It Fly, which is right over here. This book published in February of 2016, uh, self-published, became a Wall Street Journal bestseller and went on to, for the next four years, generate about a half million dollars. And only about $100,000 of that was from the actual book sale, meaning the physical copy of the book and digital copy. The audio book actually has more sales than both the digital or ebook plus physical copy. And about half of that income came from the result of a... Um, course that came out after too. And that wasn't planned either. I could probably do even better if I were to rewrite this book. And I probably should very soon because some things it hasn't changed, but there are more tools and things that can help make starting a business even easier now more case studies. I love the idea of a second edition of a book similar to when I read the second edition of the four hour work week, there was some case studies that weren't in there before. And also some success stories that could help further motivate people. Um, In addition to that, now that I know I have a course plus other courses, you can come back and add new things like, hey, check out my course, right? Or somehow kind of lead people that way. Um, And that's really exciting. That's the benefit of of using a platform like Amazon where you can easily change things, even with a print version of a book on Amazon because you don't order them ahead of time. It's print on demand. So if ever I have to make an update or maybe I wanna promote some event that I have going on, FlynnCon or something, I can just go back, update the manuscript, upload it, boom, it's ready to go. The next people who buy even the physical book get the new version, and that's pretty cool. With the other book that I have, Superfans, which is also indeed self-published, it was self-published through a company called New Type Publishing, and I'm very thankful I went through this because they've had relationships with Barnes & Noble and other places, airports, whatnot, to have my book be in person in places that Will It Fly just wasn't able to get to. And as a result of that, um, I've reached more people and have sold more books, which is really fantastic. But if I need to make any changes, yes, the ebook version and even the audio version, if I want to re-upload that, can work. 
But the physical copy version, well, there are thousands of copies of these uh, still waiting to be sold because I ordered, I don't know, you remember 20, 30,000 of them up front. Um, most of them are sold, but you know I want to get through all that first before perhaps either another order or an updated version. It's likely just going to be another order first because right now there really isn't anything in addition to add right now. But anyway, we're going to be talking about writing books today, and I want to tell you a little story about how I wrote this book right here, Will It Fly? Upside down. All right, so Will It Fly was a chore, but... I was number one, like we talked about yesterday, driven, knowing that this was going to help people. It was surveys, it was micro-testing of certain components of this book. It was, thanks for the thumbs down, by the way, it still helps with the algorithm. I hope you have a better day. Turn that thumbs down around. Turn that frown upside down. Don't be a clown. Um, I, I swear, I think people just do the thumbs down to hear how I respond to that, because I'm having, having a lot of fun with that, so. Bring it on! No, I'm just kidding. I uh, appreciate you for being here, taking time. Anyway, this book, I knew I wanted to write. I knew it was going to help people. So I was willing to dedicate to time. That's step one. You need to commit to this process. I think also expectations-wise, I expected to, to bang this out in like three months. And when I started to sit down to write, it was like, okay, uh, this isn't going to go the way that I think it's going to go because although I can bust out, you know, 5,000 words in a blog post in three hours, I was spending, you know, two hours in front of a blank screen watching that cursor go, you gonna write something? Hello, anybody there? And then it started to say, you're not good enough. This book's never gonna work. You're not cut out for this. And it just started to like blink at me in that way. And I wrote, I remember one paragraph in like a three hour period, another paragraph, in another four hour period. It just had a different feel to it. Because writing a book feels more, I don't know, real, right? Than a blog post. And I remember it, <laughs> Uncle Pat's story time could be a new podcast as a road to your family history. That'd be really cool, actually. Honestly, it could just be business stories and, and very more NPR-like. Thank you for the idea, I appreciate you. Uh, and appreciate the thumbs up to counter that thumbs down that came in. Anyway, there were so many times I gave up on writing this book because again, I just didn't believe it. I uh, thought it was a waste of time because I could write, up, write blog posts and do podcasting and do other things much faster. So I put it aside. But then again, I got encouragement from my audience kind of sharing directly and indirectly that this was a book I needed to write, again, to help people get started. And again, I started to cast a vision of how useful this book would be to help people. This was one thing that I learned early on, even before I hired a coach, which I eventually did. But it was something that was really helpful for me to imagine people on their vacation, at home, uh, at work, sort of reading this book, clustering it with post-it notes, highlighting it. It really encouraged me. And what was beautiful was just to fast forward. I remember during launch week, I had a whole mess of people send pictures that were sort of similar to the ones that were in my head. And that really drove me understanding that, wow, there's people out there who need this information and visualizing. And, and, and creating affirmations for myself every day that I can do this. I'm a writer. I have information that can help people. Don't let the fear get in the way. This is really helpful. This writing thing, it's a mental game more than anything, really. There are mechanisms and systems. I'm going to teach you some of these things. But honestly, it is more a mental game than anything. If anybody here in the chat has ever written a book, let me know. And let me know if you agree that this is more of a mental game more than it is a fingers to keyboard sort of game. And Fatima Costa says, love you, Pat. Anyone who gives you a thumbs down doesn't understand your heart and intent to serve. Love you and love all you do. Thank you so much, Anna. I appreciate you for that. I like the thumbs down. It, I think, number one, keeps me humble. Number two, helps me even realize how even more special the thumbs ups are. And number three, it just helps me realize that there's even more people that I can help out there. And I, and I appreciate that. If, if it was all thumbs up all the time, I think I'd be doing something wrong, right? You have to kind of step into a message that, might upset people sometimes in order to make some noise. And this is where I want to go next. Thank you so much for the transition, by the way. Because you have to consider, like we talked about yesterday, the why behind this book. What is its purpose for you? What is its purpose for others? And visualizing that. And honestly, if you were to write a book that would please everybody, then it would be a book that wouldn't be great because it wouldn't be bold enough for people to really take action with. It would be more average because you're trying to please everybody. 
So I think niching down into who it is that you're serving, this is something I did with this book. This was people who are literally starting from scratch, who have no idea what they're doing, or maybe they've started and failed and are wanting to give up. These are the kinds of people who I'm visualizing when I was writing this book. With super fans, it's a little bit different. For me, it is those who perhaps have customers or perhaps those who were on social media and who have grown this giant following and all of a sudden the algorithms change and they lose their following or they have to now pay to play or all these other things. These were the kinds of people I was imagining with this business uh, book. And um, the idea behind super fans was building super fans allows you to have a defense toward all these walled gardens that are the, all of our social media platforms and algorithms are putting up for us. And it allows us to build in, uh, business insurance such that no matter what happens in, te in technology, no matter what, you're going to have people who support you and you're going to be able to grow your business from the inside out versus trying to be so magnetic and trying to bring new people in, in which case you are giving them a good reason to come, but maybe not a great reason to stay. And so that that was sort of the thesis or, or, or point of super fans. But anyway, once we fin finally understand exactly what we're writing and who we're writing for, then we got to take all these ideas, all these things in our head and lay them out in a way that we can organize them such that they would be legible, readable, organized properly in a book. And this is where I love my favorite tool in the world. Wah. Road to your family from Dr. Severin Bryan. Uh, right there with you on the, on the is and staying focused while writing my first book. Congrats on writing your first book. That's so exciting. I will tell you, even if you've already gotten started writing your book um, and you're having some trouble sort of putting fingers to keyboard or pen to paper, the best exercise you can do pre-getting ready for the book is to use post-it notes. And I would just get a whole chunk of post-it notes, hashtag not sponsored, although I should be because I talk about them all the time. I literally have bricks of this stuff in my home. You can recycle them and should recycle them, by the way. But many of you, many of you have heard my strategy with pulling out these ideas from your head to be able to brainstorm and organize essentially at the same time. The whole goal here of this exercise is to come out with an outline. You cannot write a book without an outline. You can write things. You can write passages. You can write little moments and stories. But we need to create a book here, which means we need to take all these organized ideas and put them in the right order. We need to make them understandable. We need to see if they they even make sense, right? So here is the process. It's called a dump and lump strategy. Not the prettiest sounding thing in the world, dump and lump, but that's exactly what we're doing. A brain dump, one idea per post-it note. After you know what the purpose of this book is and what the transformation is gonna be, just let your creative brain go and go buck wild with it. Put your editing brain aside. The problem with writing sometimes is we have two sides of our brain, right? One side, I can't remember which one's which anyway, but one side is more of the creative side. I think that's your right brain. And in your right brain, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, uh, this is what gives you new ideas. This is what gets you excited. This is where you kind of go, go and let loose a little bit. That's the part of the brain that you want to be using when you are in this brainstorming uh, phase. Because what happens is if you're just like kind of making it up as you go, you haven't outlined it or you have a rough outline and you're starting to write, well, your editing brain is conflicted with your creative brain as you're trying to come up with things and it's gonna be mediocre. And although our creative brain doesn't always get things right, it sound, it, <laughs> um, as uh, even though it doesn't always get things right, that's okay. With this brainstorming process, the dump part of this process, we need to brain dump in the most creative way possible. So whatever you need, if you need to do this in the most energetic time of the day for you, if you need like a gallon of coffee, if you need to, whatever you know your body needs to be in the most creative flow, you wanna put yourself in that position and then block out a couple hours to just go buck wild with getting crazy with ideas. As long as you have that transformation of this book, the why behind it, just let loose and write every single idea down, one idea per post-it note and just slap them, just all over the wall, over your table. I've seen rooms filled with post-it notes. I mean, I do this all the time, people. I mean, if I turn this over here, you can even see in my wall up there. I got post-it notes right over there on the other side of the wall there. 
So this is something that I go ham with all the time. It's how I come up with ideas for my online courses. It's how I come up with ideas for blog posts, podcast episodes, and even the bigger book. And so take that time, dump it, and then, again, don't scrap any ideas. Let loose. All bad ideas are welcome here. And then you're going to start to see the sea of stuff, anything and everything in no particular order to go from where they're at to the end of the book and what they can learn and or what, whatever the outcome might be at that point, right? All the things, all the stories, case studies, just random words, uh, any thoughts that come across your mind, any quotes that, that you may have heard of, um, any person who perhaps could be somebody that could lend a hand or, or, or a story um, or an example, other authors, other books, um, blogs, websites, Facebook groups, doesn't matter, all the things, just lay them all out there, right? All the steps, etc. Then part two is the lump strategy, right? This is where we take all these different post-it notes that are spread around and we go, oh, okay, well, hey, look at these. These two kind of go over here because they're all about, you know, the mindset. Um, and oh, look at these. These these are over here, but they're kind of in the end because this is about like monetization. Oh, and there's a cluster over here. Start putting the clusters together. The colors right now don't matter. Just cluster them together. And then what happens is like magic. These clusters become the different sections of your book. Maybe there's giant clusters. Those become the different parts or sections, the bigger chunks within the book. Then within those parts, you might find smaller chunks. Those can be potentially the chapters. And what's cool is now you have your editing cap on. And this is where you can now put order and hierarchy to this. So you can actually get a sense of the start to finish process of a reader or a listener while going through your book. And I promise you, this strategy is gold. It'll save you time. It'll allow you to be more creative when you need to be creative. It'll allow you to organize your book in such a way where, again, the outcome here is to get the outline. That's goal number one. After learning the why and the who, get that outline. That's going to be your roadmap for writing. That's going to be the roadmap for your reader and eventually perhaps your student or customer if you want to go down that route. I would also consider, okay, well, and again, I wish I had done this sooner too. In addition to where they end up at the end of the book, I think thinking about where they end up after reading the book and wanting to work with you further, where might they go from there? Do they have a way to work with you even more? Do they have a way to get involved in your ecosystem? Do they have something like a part two or a step two? If you have that, keep that in mind, write that down, have that be sort of part of the last chapter, if you will, because now you can take them on a journey. And this is why Will It Fly did so well, because we took them from book to email and email to course. And I understand exactly what they're going through because I know what book they're reading and I know exactly who reads these kinds of books, right? So there you go. Hey, quick ask, dump and lump, baby. I know it's a weird term, but it almost sounds kind of bathroomy. But hey, now, now you won't forget. DJ Eshelman says, the book I'm publishing second was the first I wrote in 2017, Nanos for the Win. Writing uh, nano, uh, NaNoWriMo, uh, wrote it in November 2017. I wrote mine in, I wrote Superfans in November of 2019. And the reason why I wanted to share this book stuff now is because I want you to start thinking about your book and who it's for, what it's about, perhaps having an outline ready by November. Because November is something called NaNoWriMo or National Novel Writers Month. Thank you, DJ for uh, prompting this. And now is a good time to at least start thinking about it. Even like literally 10 minutes a day thinking about it, starting to brainstorm a little bit, maybe taking a two hour chunk next week to put all these things together and actually create this outline, continuing to work on it. The beauty of an outline as well is before you even start writing this book, you can share it with people and go, hey, how does this roadmap look to you? Is this something that you'd be interested in getting into? You don't have to have the names of your chapters. You don't have to have all the exact stories. In fact, there's gonna be a ton of holes because now you have this book and this outline and you see the roadmap, but you don't you haven't been to all these stops before. You haven't, you know, gone through this journey before. Um, but now you can sort of plug in those holes beforehand with topic based post-it notes or topic based uh, parts of the outline so that when you begin writing, you can start writing. We're going to go through the actual writing process in just a minute because I have some stories to share about that and how much of a struggle that was for me. Again, it's 
primarily a mental game, this writing thing. Um, part of it is, I don't think I'm good enough. These words aren't the right words. Is anybody going to read this? Am I wasting my time? All the usual suspects. Like, they, 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 they're going to come out again, right? Writer's block is a real thing. But anyway, NaNoWriMo coming up in November. Now is a good time to start thinking about this, and which is why we're talking about it here at the uh, mid, mid part of or end of September. Dump and lump, baby. <laughs> so that's the strategy. Get that outline. Dump, brain dump. Post-it notes, organize, outline, hierarchies, chunks, and then we, we we lump the things together, right? Now you have your outline. And then eventually you want to get to be able to convert the post-it notes that you see into a sort of time-based or um, chronologically based, if you will, for the reader outline. And that, guess what? Becomes your table of contents. This is the magical formula, a way to get your TOC your table of contents already created, which is super cool. Now, your table of contents becomes your guide for writing, which is really cool. I would save these post-it notes, however. I wouldn't actually let go of them just yet and put them in the recycle bin because these post-it notes become part of the strategy for writing. How? Well, here's what I would do. This is what I eventually learned because I started to go, okay, I have my outline for my book, Will It Fly? Fantastic. I'm ready to go. Introduction, chapter zero, or, you know, prelude or whatever. And I'm sitting there on my keyboard, and it's literally like, like, just tooth and nail, like, grind, right? Because I tried to start from the very beginning and imagine, okay, like, when a person opens this book, these are the first words they're going that, that they're going to read. Right, we need a dump and lump icon. I don't know. There is the there are certain icons that may make sense for that DJ, but I'm not going to mention it. Uh, everybody with a coffee DNA, you're halfway there. Okay, so here's the big tip: you don't have to start in the beginning. What? Yeah, you don't have to start in the beginning. When I hired my coach, after struggling for six months to write Will It Fly, grinding to get those couple paragraphs up within blocks of time, I mean, that's, I, I, I did something right, which I recommend to, to you, which is to try and consistently write every single day, or at least every other day. Like, every day is better because there is, you know, an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and your mind is an object that if you haven't written before, it's been at rest for a long time. This is a new thing, a new muscle that you're need, needing to flex, and it's hard. But if you write every day, even a little bit, I'll share with you some examples of exactly how this might turn out with super fans because I do have data to go behind this. You start to pick up momentum, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So as long as you're staying consistent every day, blocking out a certain period of time now, even 30 minutes can be good. I think any less than 30 minutes, it becomes hard because it takes some time to get into that flow. But I think 30 minute chunks at least. And yes, sometimes you have to kind of just step away. I know some people, and again, your style might be different, but I do know that there are exercises and even, even programs to learn how to start to just write every day to get that muscle going. But I know that there's some people who can go, okay, I'm gonna take two weeks or even one week. I'm gonna travel to Hawaii and I'm gonna lock myself in a hotel room and I'm just gonna bang this out. And in many cases that maybe what we might have to do because we don't have consistent 30 minutes a day or more to write every single day and to flex that muscle. So I'm just going to put myself in the deep end and go, bam, I'm just going to be all in during this time. That, in my opinion, would be very exhausting. I don't know how I would function as a writer in that sort of uh, environment, although I would imagine that with a little bit of pressure and a deadline, you know, you get moving, right? Flow comes. We all know flow, right? This sort of ability for us to be in the moment, to not have anything distract us and to just create and to, to, to perform at a high level. That kind of flow comes with a little bit of pressure, a little bit of a challenge. Without that challenge, without a little bit of that pressure, it's hard to get into that flow, I promise you, right? What, you coming to Hawaii? Bro. 
is literally Bruh. the place I'm going to go to first once we can start traveling again. Absolutely. <laughs> that explains why I don't do anything, because I live in Hawaii, LOL. Well, you need to get out of Hawaii for a couple of weeks to write your book and be like, oh my, my gosh, I can't imagine not coming back to Hawaii. Like, let me get through this so I can come back as soon as possible. What's it like living in Hawaii, by the way? What island are you on? I'm curious. I'm, I'm very curious because um, April and I have talked before. Anyway, Margaret says, I know when writing essays, I had to go back and write the intro paragraph once I'd written the paper. Yes, thank you for bringing me back. Uh, this is the idea that you don't have to start from the beginning. Again, you have this outline. You can start with the section of the book that you're most excited about, the part that you already know. The part that you know you perhaps have even already written about on a blog or talked about on a podcast. These become so much easier because you already know and you, you've kind of gotten the language already. I will also say you have to realize that the first draft of your book is going to be the worst draft of your book. In fact, you need to have it be messy. You need to have it be just not completely organized. The outline will do most of the job for you, but even within each chapter, it doesn't have to be fully fleshed out. You just have to write and put all your nasty ideas in there, things that just maybe don't even make complete sense as they're coming out of your brain. In fact, I know a lot of writers who take their backspace or delete key off of their keyboard when writing so that they are forced to just leave everything that comes to mind because it's the second round that I feel is even more important than the first round. It's taking all those ideas, all those messy things that you've talked about, the stories that you told, maybe in not such a great way, and then now fine-tuning them in a way where readers can really get into it and you can actually start putting structure to it. The first draft has to be messy. And if only I knew, because I thought I had to have it perfect around the first go and I was editing as I was writing. Again, you kind of want to take the writing game similar to how you did your dump game. Your, your, your brainstorming dump, that is, your brain, your brain dump. And that's, you just, you just kind of try to get into that creative writing flow, right? If you start to go, oh, that, that doesn't make sense there. I'm going to kind of copy paste that, move it here. And I'm going to start to put order. Like it's going to start to slow you down. And this is the other thing that my, my coach taught me is just to write like I write blog posts. Just put it out there and you can edit it later. Just get it out there. And when you think about it, our blog posts are essentially like first drafts of things. And we can always go back and edit them. Our blog, in fact, is just a first draft of things that were kind of coming to mind in a chronological order and aren't the things that should be read in order, in fact. We don't write in order the same way people should consume. This is why I think we should all have a start here page on our website. But anyway, go back, look at your, look at your outline, find that post-it note. It should still be up on a wall or a desk somewhere. And you go, okay, I'm gonna write chapter six because that's about this thing that happened to my husband and I'm gonna pull that post-it note out. I'm gonna pop it on my screen or somewhere right next to my desk. And I'm gonna go, the blinders go on and everything else. I'm writing that chapter as if it was its own essay or blog post. And that is really helpful. When you can narrow your focus in that way and the post-it notes again help, it's a physical thing that you plop down or repaste on your, on your desk or computer and go, Nothing else matters right now but this. And of course, within that chapter, you might have other post-it notes that sort of support it or stories or case studies or people that sort of just are in there. And then you could start sort of start, start putting words to paper, fingers to keyboard related to that, right? Caddius, welcome. EJ, the Travel Diva, welcome in. Thank you so much for being here. You guys are awesome. In graduate school, all, uh, all papers lead to your final thesis. Yes, exactly. So all the papers you write, all the things sort of lead to the end. And they're sort of done in chunks. This was really hard for me to understand because like, why would you start in the middle? Don't people read the first part? Yeah, but you have to get that, that, that energy going. You gotta get, get those wheels greased a little bit or else they're just not gonna move. So start with the parts of the book that are most exciting to you. I promise you, it's just gonna be so much easier. You'll be able to connect them into everything else later. I promise you, it's hard to see up front but when you write chapter six first, and then you write chapter two, then you write chapter 12, and then you write chapter one, you're like, oh, I kind of see where things are headed now. And then you write chapter three, because that's next. And then you're like, oh, chapter four was a struggle. So I'm going to write chapter seven. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I got a great idea now. Now I kind of know what, what to put in chapter three. And you can see these things. Your post notes move from one spot, the sea of post notes, and you start to see a bunch of holes as you've moved them and have 
conquer them over here. Now let's just talk about the practice of writing in general. Like I said, every day, if possible, try to find some time. When I wrote Will It Fly, when I wrote Will It, Will it Fly, this was written between the hours of 5.30 and 7 in the morning. This was written with two young kids in the house where if they were up, there was no way I was going to find concentrated time to write. So what I did was I practiced my Miracle Morning from Hal Elrod. That's a book, by the way, where you practice waking up earlier, going to bed earlier, of course, but waking up earlier for you to take care of your needs, your personal development. And in my case, it was finding time to write this book. And I'll tell you, with that 7 o'clock hour where the kids would typically wake up, and I knew that basically my writing time was done. I mean, I woke up with focus. I woke up with new energy because I got a good night's sleep. I also saw a direct correlation between the food I was eating and the words I was writing, the number of words I was writing. It was such an interesting thing. I wish I had studied it or dove deeper into it. And I haven't really shared this before, but I did see a direct correlation between healthy foods that I was eating and better writing days. The days that I had uh, what we call a treat day in the family, we don't call it a cheat day because cheating is bad. We call it a treat day, right? I was on sort of this, this diet, more of a paleo type thing back then. And then every once in a while, I would go and like have ice cream with the kids and my wife. And I would always notice that the next day, I would just feel like a slog. I would just be dragging and writing was so much harder. And this book, because it was so important for me to finish and I really wanted to get through it, I stopped treating myself and I said, you know what? I'm just gonna have a giant cake all to myself at the end of this writing period. And it was kind of crazy, right? Can you wipe the aqua notes off and reuse them? Oh, I don't know what aqua notes are. Is that like notes that you take when you're in the shower? Underwater. The power of functional medicine, indeed. Nature's fuel, right? Anyway, just wanted to share that. I think that if you are really committed to and serious about this, I would go, you know what? I'm going to write this in this many months. I'm going to spend this amount of time each day. I'm going to communicate with my loved ones and go, hey, this is something that I'm, it's really important to me that I want to finish. If I could have your support, that would be fantastic. Here's what's going to need to happen. I promise I'm going to support you as well. And just communicate when you might need some support. And then just really go all in on trying to focus on your health, getting good sleep, and cranking out this book, right? It's so exciting once it's done. I promise you the light at the end of the tunnel is there. And when you have this final first draft, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is not what it's going to be, but I did it, and now I can take what I started, refurbish it, refine it, and put it out there. And it's going to be so fun to have readers read your book. That vision that I casted, that I mentioned earlier, of readers reading my book, like pictures on the beach, post-it notes, etc., was so important for me as I was writing. Because after you're done writing the middle parts of the book that maybe you're more excited about, you're eventually going to have to write the other parts that maybe you haven't done enough research for yet or you just don't quite know how to say yet. It's going to be a little bit of a drag. It's going to be a little bit of, of a challenge. But it's that vision casting of the readers that truly can help you. In fact, if I can, let me see if I can find here on uh, Google. I'm going to find uh, see if I can... find some screenshots of people reading their book. Like even on Google here, I'm noticing. So this is this is somebody this is somebody reading it, right? In Poland, in fact, in front of a lake. Here I am in front of somebody's fireplace. Here's I here I am with somebody's kid reading my book. Here's somebody using the exercise in the book to fold the paper airplane. Right? Here's another paper airplane. That's that's another thing that I included in the book. I really wanted to have different mechanisms to interact. Why are we all talking about donuts? We just started talking about eating healthy. I see you all talking about donuts. <laughs> but it's so cool. And this, this vision casting truly was life-changing for me in terms of writing this book. Because again, more, more and more people, you know, that. Another one. So cool. So what is this paper airplane thing? This was something that came while writing. I was sharing an exercise to have people 
consider what life might be like five years down the road. You might remember this test within Will It Fly. It's called the airport test. It was something that was adopted from Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. And uh, I adopted it and with permission from them actually uh, to put it into this book to help people learn how to find an idea that they want to work with. Much like how they use that same idea of the airport test to find an employee that they want to work with who would also want to work with them. I want to know that my vision is something that I want and I want to know that that vision supports where I am now and how I can get there. Anyway, I'm not going to go over the airport test, but I had this idea while writing this book because I wanted people to share this book with others, um, to have people take this exercise that you take one piece of paper, fold it into four quadrants, and then I actually have instructions in the book and in the companion course that goes along with this. Remember I talked about the companion course yesterday, the way that I'm able to collect more than half the reader's email addresses using a companion course. Anyway, I have a video within the companion course that shows people how to fold a paper airplane. And I have them take this exercise and I have them fold a paper airplane with it so that they'll keep it. And, and it'll be a reminder for them to keep going to be a resource for them if they need a reminder about why they're doing what they're doing and to keep them on track. And I actually have people throw it and fly it. And I, of course, I just help them fold a really, you know, high performing one or one that would convert really well in terms of like attempts to flight ratio. But the now we're talking about Cinnabons. Yo. You guys are crazy. <laughs> uh, thank you all for the support for this book, by the way. But anyway. It's been really cool to see people take pictures of their paper airplanes and, and shooting them out and sending them on video, and it makes people go, "What? why did you do that? And they go, oh, this book, Will It Fly? I absolutely love it, and it just makes me so happy. And now, seeing the same thing with superfans, right? Somebody using superfans at their event. Superfans while eating, what is this, rice or risotto or something? Superfans here while another lake picture. I don't know why we're using a gorilla pod back there, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Anyway, here's uh, a user with Will It Fly there. Just so cool. So I embedded within the book a mechanism to get more social shares. And this was something that was sort of brand new or just kind of starting uh, around the 2016 period where it was becoming easier to, with our phones, take pictures, to use hashtags into Instagram and Twitter and uh, LinkedIn and Facebook sort of pictures as a result of exercises being done in the book. So see if you can inject a couple ways that you can do that because um, it's just really neat. And so I get constant, every single week, I get people who are like, hey, I'm reading your book, here it is, uh, or sharing their exercises. It's pretty awesome. Cool. Thank you, Katana, for buying the book for friends. That's, that's great. CMH paper airplane, exactly. <laughs> Pat the engineer, build airplanes, love it, and it's in the book. Yeah, and it actually ties into a story, and because I didn't know how to start the book, in fact. I wrote the rest of the book first, and then I didn't know how to intro it, in fact. And with the idea of, of, of flying, it reminded me, in fact, of a story that uh, involved my son related to when I taught him when he was three how to fold a paper airplane. So it all kind of came connected. It came together. It, 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 it almost is like, how did you not know to use that story? I didn't know. It just came out creatively in the writing process. And the story is a story about how my son, I, and I just remembered this while I was writing, I taught him how to fold a paper airplane. And that came as a result, that, that, that thought came as a result of this exercise, which I, again, didn't know I was going to go there while writing the book. It wasn't in the outline process, but it just came. And the story was my son folded a paper airplane. I showed him, but he kind of rushed it and it didn't fly. And he was like, I'm done. I'm not going to fold paper airplanes. And so I kind of went back and I said, okay, follow me step by step. It's not going to take that long. Do one at a time. And then he threw it and he, he flew it. And then like he got obsessed with paper airplanes for quite a bit. Um, and, and it's this idea of we as entrepreneurs, we sometimes rush. We sometimes see people start a process and we go, okay, I'm going to do that too. And without getting proper instruction, we don't actually have a chance for it to fly right from the get-go. And this whole purpose of this book is to have me guide you into creating something that can fly or understanding what won't. And that story is sort of just beautifully tied in. And then that story actually came out in a commercial, right? I don't even know. And again, that, this just part of the creativity came out 
during the writing process, which was cool. That story did not come out in the, the brainstorming process. Uh, let me see if I can find Will It Fly trailer so you can see just how kind of this comes in. Have you ever come up with an idea only to throw it away because you just weren't sure it was going to work? Those initial what ifs, what if this is successful? What if this is the one? They all start changing into, well, what if this fails? What if I let someone down? What if I'm just wasting my time? But what if you did know? What would change if you knew the answers to those questions up front? If you knew that this idea of yours had some wings? You'd have the confidence to give it a shot. You'd be motivated to keep going. And you would know that what you're doing is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Well, I want to be your guy. I want to help you figure out whether or not this idea of yours will work. So before you launch, the question I want to help you answer is, will it fly? There it is. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, that's today's income stream. So thank you. The funny story about that was, again, the trailer idea just came later. Um, and I wanted to tie in that story with the paper airplane. And my son was super nervous. So we created all these paper airplanes. Yes, we recycled. I, actually, we, created, we did some arts and crafts with all that paper afterwards. We're very conscious about paper use uh, here in the Flynn household. But anyway, um, he was very nervous. So every time like we hit record, he just kind of would forget what to do or forget where to go and, you know, timing and all that stuff. Um, but the cameraman was just like, just tell him we're going to practice, but I'm, I'm going to I'm going to roll. I'm going to record. And uh, the first time we did that, it, that was the take, like when he didn't know that it was being recorded. It just shows you how sometimes when the record button is on, just for whatever reason, we get so nervous because it's actually something that's sort of capturing that moment versus just living, just being and, and turning the camera on instead uh, can can help you get there. Uh, and then that final shot with the airplane coming towards you, that took 100 tries to get perfectly right and, and, and to have him sort of throw it because we didn't have two cameras going at the same time. Um, that, was a, that was the only second shot. Anyway, that was super fun. Um... Yeah. All right, my coffee is cold, which means we must be close. We've got 14 minutes left. Let's talk about tools. Let's talk about tools you might use to write. Now, I remember when I was writing Will It Fly, I wanted to do what all the pros were doing. So I got access to this tool called Scrivener. Scrivener is a great tool, by the way. Scrivener, Scrivener. Scrivener, Scrivener. Literature in Lattes, the go-to app for writers of all kinds. Oh, that's kind of cool. See the forest or the trees. Rewrite, reorder, rejoice, research within reach. So it's a it's an amazing tool that allows you and gives you access to even like a thing like a post-it board note, a post-it note board, um, the ability for you to see all the chapters on the left-hand side. It just really neatly organizes these things in a way that allows you to mentally understand where you are in the book and how things connect. It's especially helpful, I've heard, for fiction writers because you can create character profiles and all this kind of stuff too. But I knew a lot of people who were using Scrivener. And I was like, whoa, awesome. So I got access to Scrivener. I started using it and I was like, I hate it. This is too overwhelming, it's too complicated. I feel like I have to learn a new language in order to use this. I'm sure it's helpful, but I just, I just wanted to write. And I felt like I was spending too much time trying to organize in a way that just wasn't meant for me. I'm not saying Scrivener is bad for you, but it just didn't work for me. And just because other people were using it, I realized, didn't mean I needed to use it. So I went to my coach and I was like, okay, Scrivener is not working out. How might you recommend that I write this book in a way that I feel comfortable? Well, he goes, well, how do you feel comfortable writing? Or what do you feel comfortable writing in? And I'm like, well, I only use Google Docs for my blog posts. 
And he was like, oh, we'll just use Google Docs for your chapters. And I was like, well, that's, and I was like looking for an excuse and I was like, well, actually that I guess could work. For whatever reason, I thought because this was a book, because it was more professional, because it was a bigger thing that I had to change my writing habits. No, I just started to write these chapters. Again, pulling out post notes from my dump exercise and putting them on the computer or wall next to me while writing. And then boom, I knew exactly what I had to write about. I treated it like a blog post. And, and actually very similarly, blog posts and chapters of books can be seen in a very similar fashion where within the beginning of the chapter, you kind of need a hook, a reason for people to continue reading onto that chapter. You need supporting points. You need case studies, etc. <laughs> yeah, let's not share that GTO. I'm, I'm not sure they would love to, to see that, but um, it's great. I know a lot of people who use it, Michael Hyatt and several others. I just, I tried it. It didn't work for me and that's okay. And it may or may not work for you. It could be I've shared it with some people and they said this is the exact thing that they needed. So I'm not I'm not clowning on it. I'm just saying it didn't work for me. Hate is a strong word. I shouldn't have used that. So I used Google Docs. And the way that I set it up was, in fact, I'm wondering if I can actually, I haven't visited this in a while. Let me see. Will it fly? Hmm. Okay, okay, I don't know if this is it, but will it fly manuscript? I have the introduction, part one, part two, part three, part four, part, part five, That were those were the lumps that I found. And within there, within mission design, for example, I have chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. What does chapter five say? say it looks very small. Call the action to fold paper airplane, the same sheet that they wrote their airport experiment on. Ha. Cool, so I didn't even write that out yet. Part one, chapter one. Before your journey begins. Vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. Oh, this is part one, mission design. The forward, oh, I think the forward is in, is in the other spot, but let me show this to you. Mission design, vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. Just like here. Ha, it is the same. That's kind of cool. So, and Google Docs can be used on a phone. So what's nice is if you get just like little random ideas or perhaps you, you find the name of a chapter that, that you wanna use, of one that you've started to write, just like you can pop it in there on your phone on the go. Scrivener, I'm not sure if that is um, possible to use in terms of your devices. Uh, check it out, this is my coach, Azul Taronas, if you wanna check him out, authorswholead.com. Um, but here are some comments that he's leaving for me. I love this, you really did a great job of framing the mission, well done. I love the casual user interface here, hearing about James's email and how you're responding is inspiring. This is why this works because you do things Pat Flynn's way, not the others, not the way others you should. He's leaving some feedback here, which is pretty cool. I think the story, let's go back into the manuscript. And hopefully this is helpful to see, um, I hope this is helpful to kind of see the inner workings of this. Uh, parts of books that, that I mean, the, I'm not going to get into it specifically, but there's other parts of books like the front matter, which are things like the table of contents, the forward dedication. Here is the dedication to Will It Fly, to my parents for giving me wings, to my wife for giving me air, to my kids for giving me purpose, and to you for giving it a chance. From Matt. Love it. That was before he started working for me. Uh, let's see. Forward. Oh, where was the forward? I'm, it's not here. Oh, the for the forward is from <laughs> to be written by some authority figure that you ask. Aim big, like Tim Ferriss. I wasn't able to get Tim. In fact, he does not write forwards for books. I found. I did ask him though, but eventually I was able to get Jay Papasan from the One Thing, which was so amazing. Uh, oh, introduction. Here's here's the story with Evernote is great too. Rob uses Evernote. That's absolutely fantastic. 
Here's the introduction. When my son Kaoni turned three, I couldn't wait any longer. It was time for me to teach him something that my dad passed on to me when I was a kid, a skill that I have gratefully kept with me all these years, like riding a bike. It's something you never forget once you learn how to do. I grabbed a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper, turned to my son and said, do you want to make a paper airplane? Pat, this is already wonderful. The simple, playful nature of your writing already says Pat Flynn. Thank you. Oh, it's... <laughs> anyway, I struggled in the beginning when I started putting fingers to keyboard, trying to write like somebody else. And I've told this story before, but I tried to write like the books I was reading. Around this time, I was reading a lot of Malcolm Gladwell books, right? David, David and Goliath, Outliers, Blink, etc. And Malcolm Gladwell has a very specific kind of writing that is just such an absolute joy to read. And I felt that I had to write like him too. This was part of the struggle and what my coach Azul helped me through. He said, just write like you. Write like you write on your blog post. That's what will make this book come from you. In the beginning, I tried to write like Malcolm Gladwell because I looked up to him and I was like, I want my books to be read just like his. But I'm not Malcolm Gladwell. I do not have access to all these studies. I don't know how to extrapolate like he does from these studies and connect the dots. But I know stories. I know my own experiences. I know how to help people start businesses. So let's just talk about it in that way. So that's exactly what I did. Pat, did you save drafts of your work? I, I'm sure they're around. Yes, I did. It'd be interesting to go back and see those. I don't know where they're at, though. But that's a good question, Margaret. I see that Pat Flynn got you on the time. Yeah. But again, I apologize. Today we started an hour earlier due to a workshop that I'm going to be running in about an hour from now. Caleb is come, coming over to the house uh, and setting up so that we can you know, deliver value to those who sign up to this video podcasting workshop that's coming soon. So anyway, it's been fun to see this. But when I changed my mindset to go, I'm just going to write like me. This is, this is very much like how I just write blog posts or create content online. A little bit of a set up for, hey, my dad taught me something that I want to pass down to my own kids. Folding a paper airplane. This has a very, do you want to build a snowman sort of feel to it. And this was before Frozen. Oh, no, maybe, maybe not. I don't remember when Frozen came out. Anyway, do you want to make a paper airplane? Cool. So yes, write like you. In fact, write conversationally. You don't have to write like you're writing an essay. Now, I will say that with an asterisk because if you're writing a sort of professional piece and you have professionals, scientists, if you will, or whoever, higher end uh, executives, for example, um, I mean, still write like you, but just remember who you're writing for. I mean, obviously, if I was writing to kids, I would speak differently than I was writing to adults. Then if I was writing to, you know, people who are trying to get their PhD and learn how to start a business, it's going to be a little bit different. And thus, the language may change a bit here and there. But generally speaking, just be comfortable writing like you and, and don't worry about it, especially in the first draft. Your first draft is going to be the worst draft. There was another book that helped me. If I go to Amazon, this helped me through the writing process. I recently viewed Superfans because I was sort of following... The, the ratings have gone up since talking about it yesterday, so thank you again so much for that feedback. Uh, did Will It Fly increase? Yeah, Will It Fly increased too. We're at 956. By the way, this book is not me. This is a different Pat Flynn, by the way, so just keep that in mind. I've had people go, Pat, your book is great, and they tag me, and I'm like, that's not my book. This is another Pat Flynn, somebody in the workout, nutrition, fitness space, kettlebells, etc. So I'm sure a brilliant book. Pat Flynn's are awesome just all around, I guess. But uh, just keep that in mind. Okay. Anyway, where was I going? Oh, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont. This book was really helpful. I've learned so much from listening to this book. And right now, it seems to be $0 on Audible. It's probably because I have a credit. Yeah, I have 12 Audible credits. I really have not been listening to much lately. I've been doing so much. And that's okay. But... Bird by Bird is a book to help you get through your writer's block. And I would highly recommend reading this book. It's playful writing and it has some really good lessons. Like one step at a time is the idea of bird by bird, right? Um, and 
the visualization or the thing that I remember after reading that book was this idea of like, like taking sand and just like making a pile of sand. Too often when we are writing books, we feel like we have to build the sandcastle as we're grabbing sand. But the way that you build a sandcastle is you take a whole bunch of sand, you pack it down, you, you know, wet it a little bit, moisten it, and then you start carving out the sandcastle from that big pile. And too often we're trying to build the sandcastle on our first draft. A lot of the sand that you bring is not even going to be used. But within the sand, within all those different stories, parts, pieces, steps, etc., that castle then lies underneath all that. It lies within that. So your first draft might be 50%, 30% not great. 30, like 70% of it not even being used. But it's that 30% that's within that can be the gold. Another thing that helped me with some of the chapters was it was just much easier to dictate these chapters. So what I did was I took my phone and instead of just writing it out, I found that my flow was a little bit better when I spoke things sometimes, especially with stories. So oftentimes I would take my phone and I would dictate the chapter instead of writing it out. And then I would transcribe it and that would be become part of the first draft. Now I'll tell you, I wrote way more words in that way or wrote way more words that way, but more words were not used. A higher percentage of words spoken were not actually worthwhile keeping in there or even using at all. But again, by doing that, by getting 5,000 words out in, in, in you know, a 20 minute period with my voice, well, hey, the 500 words that are in there in that middle of that story, that's gold. I'm gonna keep that. And that sort of refinement process comes when you come into the second draft. So uh, this is the process. And, 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 and we just talked about getting to that outline and getting through that first draft. Tomorrow, we're gonna start talking about marketing and how to get your book seen and heard by others, even as you are writing it. One of my favorite things to do is let people in on a process as a part of the marketing efforts. And so we're gonna talk more about that tomorrow. So we're at the top of the hour here. For those of you who are coming in now, just realize that I'm done <laughs> today. You'll have to watch the replay. I started an hour earlier due to a scheduling conflict with a workshop that I'm gonna be hosting in about an hour related to video podcasting. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. But uh, thanks for coming either way. Team replay in the house. Bernard, welcome in. Lewis, thank you so much. Apologize. There's just schedule changes all throughout this week. Tomorrow, we're starting at 7.30 a.m. Pacific. Once again, 7.30 a.m. Pacific, and that's 10.30 p.m. or excuse me, a.m. Eastern um, because Wednesday is my meetings day and I have a mastermind call. But anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. Hopefully, today was helpful. Chat, as we wrap up here, let me know what your favorite thing or most helpful thing was that you learned today. I look forward to seeing those. And again, I thank you so much for being here. Team Flynn, you're awesome. Keep up the good work with your books. Tomorrow, we're gonna talk about starting to market and get exposure for your book, again, even as you are writing your book. So good luck to you. Thanks so much. And as always, Team Flynn for the win. Peace out, y'all. This is the income stream to help you achieve your dream. All while we keep it clean, this is the income stream. It's the kind of show where you can come and go, but then you leave inspired with no fee required. The income stream with Pat Flynn. Thank you. Somebody's asking, is video podcasting even a thing? It's changed. It's people filming their podcasts while recording to put on YouTube. That's kind of what video podcasting has become, but it's not technically podcasting in a sense. Anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate you. 7.30 a.m. tomorrow Pacific. I'll see you then. Peace out. Much love. It would behoove you to come to keep this situation going because, hey, we're learning a lot. I need to teach you all the things from A to Z. Take care. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Bruh.